uh, value to what to whatever is possible. But at the end of the day, it remains uh, it remains a very uh, big topic, something uh, you can delve into and uh, continuously learn. So I will start with the agenda. Uh, first of all, uh, I would be speaking about the objective of an investigation, and uh, I would just give us uh, a brief reference to IQ and X13. Then uh, the, we will uh, talk about the investigation process, then what constitutes an effective investigation, the what, how, and why part. Then uh, the most challenging part in any investigation, in my opinion, is uh, human performance and human factors. So uh, I'll be taking a bit of uh, time on discussing uh, the challenges with human factors investigations, and I think it would be quite interesting for all of us. The attributes of an investigator, uh, what, what would constitute a good investigator, some, someone who is good at extracting information. So I would just uh, be discussing the attributes of an investigator. Uh, subsequently, there, uh, there is a very interesting topic, which is called the procedural drift. So I would like to uh, focus on that and share my experiences about that. Uh, touch a little bit about conducting substitution tests, which are uh, which, which is a test carried out by human factor scientists and human factors investigators. And towards the end, I would focus on safety recommendations. So uh, I hope that it's going to be a good presentation. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, your participation uh, during the Q&A. And please feel free to ask any questions uh, which you think I can answer. So. We can start. As I said, uh, the IQ NX 13 is uh, considered as the Bible of accident and incident investigation. It's uh, it's referred to very routinely by accident investigation authorities. Uh, we working for the service providers also refer to it as the guidance document. And it states that the prevention that that the objective of an investigation is only one which is prevention of incidents and accidents. So how do you prevent incidents and accidents is through identification of safety deficiencies uh, by learning lessons. And the another important aspect in uh, IQ and X13, which is linked to the objective is that an investigation carried out under the provisions of IQ and X13 is going to be non-punitive and it's going to be no blame. We get inspiration from IQ and X13, as I said, being a service provider. And according to our SMS, we follow the same model. Uh, I would uh, hope that most of the service providers' safety investigations are non-punitive, and this is something which uh, all of us should encourage. Because when you start to assign liability or blame to a safety investigation, then the risks are that you won't be able to get the information which you are looking for. Uh, so basically, uh, I would repeat myself, the objective is very clear, prevention of incidents through identification of safety deficiencies, no blame, non-punitive approach to be adopted. Now I would come to the investigation process. Before I go into the details, uh, I remember a saying from one of my um, uh, instructors, one of my instructors in uh, in an accident investigation course, and he used to say, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer he used to give was bit by bit. So investigation is uh, a time consuming process. It's a big process, especially for accident investigations, but even some incident investigations could take a long time. So it's very important that uh, you follow a structured approach. Just hold on, please. It's very important that uh, a structured approach is uh, followed during the conduct of investigations. And broadly speaking, you can divide the uh, conduct of an investigation into three parts. The first part is collection of data. So before the first step towards uh, uh, towards an investigation process is the collection of data. 
you collect whatever is possibly uh, available uh, in terms of uh, a big event, its uh, components, uh, evidence gathering, uh, many forensics might be involved. And uh, again, that's, uh, that, that, that would be the first phase on which your investigation would, uh, would build on. So the first step, obviously, collect as much data as possible. Second step is the analysis of data. When you have gathered what you want to gather, which includes, uh, let's say, in a typical airline environment, it would be the crew statement, the flight data monitoring uh, data, uh, the uh, ATC transcript sometimes, if you can get access to them, uh, the, 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 uh, the CCTV footage, sometimes uh, airports uh, are ready to share uh, CCTV footages. So when you have collected all the data, it's important to analyze that data. And uh, just to make it more objective, it's important to develop a timeline of investigations because uh, time plays a crucial role and you should be able, as a, you should be able to link time with what was happened, what was happening at a particular moment. So always try to develop a timeline as part of the analysis process and use all the available data which you have gathered. Now, when you have analyzed that data, and that's going to take some time, that will take uh, a lot of uh, skill, knowledge, and experience to reach at the conclusions uh, that might require you to meet different stakeholders, speak to different uh, people. Uh, then the third and the final step is to present your findings, present your findings in an investigation report. Uh, IQ and X13 also gives us a template of a formal investigation report. So you have to put your factual information and analysis in a template, and that would be the culmination of an investigation report to some, to some extent. And when you share that formal investigation report with, uh, with the stakeholders, I would say uh, the, that's, that's pretty much the job of an investigation, investigator. But then subsequently, another phase would start, which is the implementation of those recommendations and the reaction to that, uh, 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 to those findings which you have uh, developed over the course of the investigation process. So basically, keep this thing in mind. Investigation is a time-consuming process. It's, uh, it requires commitment. It can be challenging. So divide it, divide the big parts. Divide the big parts into smaller parts and try to structure it as much as possible. Collection, analysis, presentation of findings in an investigation report. So this is how you should structure even before you venture into an investigation. Now, what constitutes an effective investigation? You can write two pages for an event and you can write 10 pages of an investigation report. It all depends on to what depth you want to go into an, uh, an incident. So basically, uh, we are looking for uh, three kinds of approaches or three three parts which or three questions which which must be answered which must be uh, answered first thing is what happened which which are pretty much the facts you should be very clear about what happened and that comes from the data gathering part of the investigation process you should try to gather as much information as possible because it's very important that you should be very clear about the facts now, how it happened and why it happened is something which you will be tested, where an investigation is, uh, investigator is challenged. The why part is basically the systemic part of any investigation process, or I would say the ecosystem, the aviation ecosystem which you are investigating. And I will, I will come to the human factor element. I will come to the human factor element in the subsequent slides. Uh, how similarly, how is basically the preconditions and you, you, you look at the symptoms, but don't stop at how you have to go in, go deeper and ask the question why. I have seen some investigation uh, templates where it's a standard uh, process to ask why it happened about 
four or five times, okay, the crew didn't follow the SOPs. Why didn't they follow the SOPs? Because the training was uh, not standardized. Training was bad. Why was training bad? Probably the instructor uh, was not selected properly. Why the instructor was not selected properly? So try to go deeper into the aviation ecosystem when you are analyzing an event and when you are trying to answer the, the why part. Now, the challenge is where do you stop? It can vary. It can vary on, uh, on multiple aspects. You can stop when you think that the risk has been reduced to as low as reasonably practical. I know it's subjective, but then you will have to have a call where you, you would stop asking the why part. But it's very important that you ask this question at least three times when you are in the process of investigating an event. Because until and unless you do that, you won't be able to get the real div dividends, uh, the real return on investment of your uh, effort and energy. So this is what, what an investigation uh, uh, should, should focus on uh, as, as, as part of the structured approach I'm talking about. Now, it's very important to talk about the attributes of an investigation. It is said in the uh, investigative world that any investigation report is a reflection of the mind of the investigator who has carried it out. So by reading an investigation report, you can get a reasonably good insight into the thinking process of the investigator or investigators who have conducted an investigation into it. So it's important to be aware and be conscious of, uh, let's say, the good attributes an investigator should have, or let me say this, uh, some attributes or call them some uh, biases you should always uh, avoid. Just hold on, please. So, uh, as you can see on the slide, the outcome of an investigation relies heavily on the knowledge, skill, and experience of an investigator. So, keep in mind, you have a big responsibility on your shoulders as the investigator at the time of uh, writing the report. And people will have a perception about you when they read the investigation report. So be, 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 be aware of this, uh, uh, this, this, this perception. And everyone, every investigator wants to do a good job and every investigator wants to have a perception that people appreciate your effort and they appreciate your approach, which has been, um, uh, which has been uh, adopted. Now, there are certain uh, traits which, uh, which are undisputed. For example, integrity, confidentiality, analytical mind, communication, and problem-solving skills. I would just focus on uh, one of the attributes, which is confidentiality. Some people uh, may seem to have uh, downplayed it. Uh, if you are an investigator, be aware of the fact that don't discuss investigations with your friends over a coffee. Don't discuss them uh, casually over the phone because that's very important because the organization has given you that trust that you, you are the investigator and it's very important to respect that trust. And confidentiality is obviously very important. As an investigator, uh, you have unrestricted access. Most of the investigators in, uh, in, uh, in service providers have uh, unrestricted access and uh, to whatever information they need. That information is documented in their SMS manuals. So obviously with, uh, with this authority comes responsibility and to some extent accountability. An investigator is also accountable to produce a reasonable product, which is a reasonably good investigation report without, without really compromising uh, the, uh, the, the integrity or the confidentiality of the people involved. Uh, similarly, analytical mind is very important. As we saw, analysis is an integral part of any investigation. And how do you have that uh, capability is by not being fixated. Always avoid fixation. Always avoid biases. Don't box yourself in into assuming something that 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 is uh, that is your perception of what would have happened especially when you are doing the analysis, uh, 
in the hindsight, you can assume things because you would be exposed to a lot of information. And the risk is that you might be exposed to having certain hardcore biases. Uh, and, uh, and, and the risk is you might be fixated as an investigator. So it's very important to continuously remind yourself that uh, as an investigator, you cannot be fixated. And that's something which, uh, uh, which I would really emphasize on. So the attributes of an investigator, as I said, are very crucial uh, towards uh, becoming a good investigator. So always try to develop your skills uh, on the same lines. Another aspect when you talk about uh, communication is that uh, as an investigator, uh, the source of your information is most of the time other people. So if you are investigating uh, an event, let's say uh, a tire burst or uh, an un unstable approach or uh, damage to aircraft, then you will have to go to the stakeholders. Uh, you will have to ask them for the training records. You uh, ask them for uh, uh, for the management systems. Uh, ask them for, uh, uh, for for other challenges they face. If it's uh, if, if uh, obviously it would be a human factor investigation. So most of the information you would be analyzing, the source would be other people. So it's very important to develop good working relationships with uh, with the people involved in the organization sometimes outside the organization. Uh, as an investigator, you might be dealing with uh, occasionally with the non-operational staff, for example, legal or, uh, or uh, insurance. So communication skills are very important. Try to have a good working relationship within your organization laterally uh, and vertically. Obviously, it's, uh, it will help you and it will help you achieve the objective of getting as much information as possible. Now I would come to the heart of this presentation, which, which is basically uh, investigating human factors. Before I proceed into human factors, I would uh, like to emphasize that, again, human factor is a huge field. Uh, people are experts in human factors. There are hundreds of books written on human factors. Uh, so by no means uh, an investigator, someone who is an engineer or a pilot or, uh, or a cabin crew or a ramp staff or a ramp manager, we cannot be really uh, human factor experts in terms of uh, achieving that level of depth. For example, uh, mostly uh, investigators working uh, in the operational uh, departments They don't have degrees in psychology. They don't have uh, uh, superior qualifications in human factors, but it's very important to have a basic understanding of human factors, which, which I would call human factors 101. So you need to understand the human factor challenges. Uh, I have a diagram there. Uh, basically, this is a very primitive reflection of uh, what human factors or human performance uh, is about. It's about human limitations. It's about uh, management system limitations. It's about the influences, about the environment, the tasks, the work processes, and all can have an, imp an impact on, on the individuals working, working uh, in an environment. So Always uh, try to educate yourself. Always try to enhance your knowledge about human factors because that will always add value. I would just uh, read out what is written in front of me because I thought that was a very good starting point to conducting any human factor investigations. And I will simply read it out to you. Accidents or incidents are not the result of an active failure, action or no action of frontline operators alone. So the important thing is that don't focus on the unsafe or active failures, action or no action of frontline operators, because they are caused from the interaction of a series of latent factors already in the system. So you have to focus on the latent factors. Latent means factors which are not visible to, 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 to you when, when, when you uh, when, when you start the investigation process, but you have to be aware of those latent factors because they will definitely be a contributory factor. And sometimes 
the primary contributory factor to the causation of an event. Hence, an investigation should not focus on the frontline operator acts, but endeavor to identify the systemic safety risks and propose mitigation against them by making recommendations. So if you are clear about not limiting self, limiting your, uh, uh, let's say, uh, approach to the actions or uh, behaviors of uh, frontline operators, uh, you are on the right path. You have to go deeper into that. And uh, it's very important to make sure that you give recommendations, keeping this challenge, keeping this, uh, uh, this uh, aspect in mind, because recommendations are primarily your proposals. I will come to that in the subsequent sw slide, because uh, it's important that how you word your recommendations. You have to keep these latent factors in mind before you give recommendations. So I uh, more on that when we come to the recommendation slide. As I said, uh, human factors is uh, an ocean. Uh, it's uh, a very interesting field. Uh, a lot of books have been written on it, but uh, a, person, a personal favorite of mine is a book uh, which was written around 16, 17 years ago by uh, a person called uh, Sidney Decker. And the title of the book is The Field Guide to Human Error Investigations. I would strongly recommend all of you, uh, the uh, investigators, if you have not read that book, please read, read the book, scan through it, and that would uh, actually endorse the views which I just mentioned about frontline operator actions and systemic causes. So the most interesting aspect of the book when uh, and I think it's in the in the uh, in the first part, uh, this book talks about two views of human performance, two views of uh, human errors, you can say. One view is the old view, and that has been uh, addressed as the bad apple theory. So uh, there there might be uh, an approach where, investigators are looking for uh, the bad apple. Uh, 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 an individual which didn't follow the process, an individual which is uh, always uh, 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 behaving in an irrational way. Uh, so, so the belief uh, in this theory is that complex aviation systems are inherently safe. It's the individuals which make them unsafe. And if you are able to identify those individuals and get rid of them, the system will become inherently safe. This is called the bad apple theory. And this is important that you are clear about this theory. Uh, can you see my presentation, Lalithia? No, we seem to have lost the presentation. Okay, let me let me try to get it back again. Yeah, we can see it now, Hassan. Okay, thanks. So, be aware of uh, be aware of this uh, trap as an investigator that uh, uh, complex systems are inherently safe and uh, people with bad behavior, so-called bad behaviors can make them unsafe. So this is, this is the theory which uh, Sydney discusses in the beginning of this book, which is called the bad apple theory. Don't look for the bad apples at all uh, because that will uh, have a very negative impact on, on, on your findings and that would uh, compromise the investigation process. Uh, there might be limitations, there might be pressures, there might be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, influences to do that, but uh, as an investigator, and I think one of the traits of the investigator, which we discussed earlier, was uh, integrity and independence. So you have been uh, the designated uh, guy for conducting independent investigation. So just be aware of this uh, methodology that you are not there to look for the bad apples. Now, what are you there for? 
you are there to identify the systemic causes, the deeper trouble into the systems, because this is the real challenge. And how do you do that? Uh, personally speaking, in my experience, uh, when I investigated uh, an event, I would always refer to one of the human factor models. And again, you can find them uh, uh, in many books. There is a lot of literature available these days on human factor models. Uh, I think anyone in, um, in the business of safety is aware of uh, the James Reason accident causation model. Uh, there is another model which is uh, getting popular these days, which is called the HFACS, or, or some people call it the UFACS, which was developed by the US Navy. Uh, and uh, there is the shell model, which uh, which which is uh, which is which talks about the influences of uh, uh, different combinations like liveware, liveware, liveware software, liveware hardware. Uh, I have taken a picture of uh, uh, a snapshot of those three models. You can uh, see them in the in the slide. Uh, the models methodologies are different, but all of them. Uh, have one thing in common that they don't focus on frontline actions only. They focus on uh, the system and they focus on the causal chain. So basically, let's take the example of the UFEX. Uh, it could be, uh, it starts with the organizational influences and then it goes into resource management, into, uh, uh, into organizational climate and all those things. So follow a model that will give a systematic approach and structure to the, to your investigation. I don't recommend a particular model, but there are many models available. Take it and try to work with it. Now, uh, I would like to talk about a phenomena which, uh, which is very interesting. And I personally speaking, I find it very instructing, very interesting. It's called the procedural drift. And uh, what is procedural drift? Uh, you can see a very, very basic uh, diagram on the slide, which shows that uh, there is uh, this uh, blue line, which is, which is the standard, which is the SOP. The, 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 the normal uh, uh, response to SOP is that this is the line you should follow. But over a period of time, uh, the procedure gets changed. Uh, they, they, uh, some, some deviations uh, start to creep in into the procedures and that becomes uh, the new norm, which, which is the red line. And uh, the challenge with the procedural drift is that it becomes, uh, the deviation becomes the new norm. So people assume that uh, the deviant behavior, which crept into the uh, procedure is the new normal. So, uh, but since it doesn't have adverse consequences, it gets to a level where the deviant behavior becomes the norm. And as an investigator, unfortunately, you get to know about it reactively, unless there is a conscious effort put in to identify the precursors to such procedural drift. So uh, as an investigator, as an investigator, uh, it's very easy to assume that negligence or uh, complacency might be the cause behind behind uh, uh, behind uh, the precipitation of an event. But in actual fact, that's an oversimplification. Negligence and complacency are not the cause because the deviant cause has become the norm now. So you know you need to go deeper. And uh, I would just talk about culpability for a minute here, that when you are investigating such behaviors, the, which are linked to procedural drift, always keep, keep in mind that there are two kinds of uh, violations, the routine violations, and this falls under the category of the routine violation, and then the situational violation. So you don't treat all the violations uh, in the same way from a discipline standpoint. I don't want to go deeper into how you discipline people because that's not the job of an investigator, but sometimes if you write a violation, uh, that can be misinterpreted if that violation was actually the result of a procedural drift. 
So you need to investigate procedural drift again in a, in, in a very uh, systematic way, uh, talk to people, uh, conduct something called a substitution test. If you see that, uh, uh, that uh, let's say an operator didn't do a brake check before approaching the aircraft and uh, uh, the aircraft was damaged, uh, probably uh, this is not, he's, he was not the only guy doing that. And uh, you, when, when you do the substitution test, with the different operators who are trained and who have the same level of experience, you will discover that this is the norm, that uh, if two brake checks need to be done, people are doing one brake check or not even one. And there might be influences, time pressure, fatigue, uh, other systemic causes, as I said earlier. So it's very important to identify those uh, It's very important to identify those systemic causes, and especially fatigue uh, and roastering, which uh, which which uh, might might be missed sometimes. So this is uh, more can be said about uh, uh, procedural drift and normalized deviation, but I think we are uh, quite pressed against time, so I would just stop here and move on to safety recommendations. Lalithia, I'll just take uh, five more minutes. Minutes. Safety recommendations are pretty much the uh, culmination of an investigation report. Whatever data gathering, whatever analysis you did, now it's the time to make a proposal for a change. For Make a proposal to the stakeholders for improvement. And uh, obviously there are certain tips or certain characteristics of safety investigations which I have written first and foremost, you don't write safety investigations out of uh, safety recommendations just out of the blue. They need to be evidence based. You need to have a compelling argument in the analysis part of the investigation, which supports that safety recommendation. So don't write a recommendation which get, gives a surprise. It has to be properly linked to your analysis. And I have seen some investigation reports from very reputed accident investigation uh, boards where they would. Uh, uh, mention uh, uh, they would make the argument in the analysis and then they would say, hence safety recommendation number one has been given to mitigate against uh, such uh, such situations. So it has to be evidence based. Similarly, a recommendation needs to be risk based. Uh, don't make it prescriptive. Uh, don't tell uh, that an individual uh, uh, should be uh, should be disciplined or, or try to avoid making prescriptive recommendations. Sometimes that might be necessary, but make them risk-based and systemic and less prescriptive. Similarly, they need to be objective. And last but not the least, they need to be cost-effective because you, we are all, as investigators, we are part of the system. We need to be aware of the challenges involved. Sometimes uh, a recommendation could be to conduct a cost benefit analysis uh, for a modification. And then you let the organizational organization know that these are the challenges. These are the pros and cons of this modification, but let's do a cost benefit analysis and then let the judgment be made by, by the stakeholders themselves. Uh, there is again a very interesting concept given by Sidney Decker in his book, and I have just uh, taken it from there. Uh, he mentions two kinds of uh, safety recommendations, high-end recommendations and low-end recommendations. So high-end recommendations are, uh, are mostly systemic, but the challenge with them is they, are, they require a lot of effort to be implemented. They are difficult to implement, but they are more effective. The low-end recommendations, which could be uh, retraining or... Uh, uh, things like uh, low level, they, which are not really up the causal chain. They are very easy to implement, but they don't have a very long lasting impact on the organization. So let's say if uh, the recommendation is that a memo should be issued that uh, engineers uh, should follow, uh, close, should follow uh, ISOP, then that memo uh, is signed by everyone, but then that that that's about it, and then uh, again, uh, the different influences will uh, will get in, and uh, that memo, the effectiveness of that memo, will be 
flaws. So always keep this graph in mind when you are giving recommendations, uh, the high end and the low end, high end being uh, more effective, highly effective, but difficult to implement, low end being uh, less effective, but, uh, but uh, uh, easy to implement. So it's a trade-off. So sometimes uh, as an investigator, you have to talk to your uh, superiors, you have to talk to different uh, groups in order to make sure what is the best impact you can get by, by giving a recommendation. Always get the recommendations uh, uh, peer reviewed or sometimes uh, discuss them with the stakeholders because every recommendation has an addressee. Uh, if you are uh, investigating uh, uh, a flight ops related event, then the recommendation will most likely go to flight ops. So develop a process or let's say as a courtesy, try to discuss those recommendations or uh, at least uh, show them, uh, show a draft copy of your recommendations with the, with the stakeholders. You don't necessarily need to get their input and agree with them because again, uh, an investing, it's only a recommendation. It can be accepted. It can be partially accepted or it can be rejected. So, uh, but it's better to narrow down the uh, divergence involved and uh, come up with a recommendation that's uh, implemented because the objective is when you, you are giving a recommendation, you are not giving it to be rejected. You are giving it to be implemented. So make all the efforts that a recommendation is implemented in, in, in the organization. And IQ and X13, it's a protocol uh, that uh, whenever an IQ and X13 report is completed, it will a draft copy will be shared uh, as part of the consultation process. And that's the time when uh, the addressees can, uh, uh, can uh, share their point of view and they may or may not agree with a particular recommendation. So uh, probably uh, this is the second last slide. Uh, uh, there, there are some recommendations uh, which are called the safety recommendations of global concern. Uh, they are called the SRGC. Uh, you can find them on ICAO Accident Investigation AIG uh, group website. It's a database of around 500 uh, SRGCs and uh, SRGCs are mostly recommendations of international interest. So uh, as, as a result of an IQ and X13 investigation, recommendations could be assigned to various uh, regulatory bodies and IQ. And it's, this is the database to refer to if you want to see recommendations of uh, uh, global interest, uh, recommendations which have an international uh, impact. Similarly, uh, Different safety boards and different regulatory bodies uh, issue recommendations. For example, the NTSB has a most wanted list. Uh, they have uh, published this document. It's available uh, in the public domain. And if you see, it says open safety recommendations. If acted upon, these recommendations will save lives and improve transportation safety. And this is what, and what a safety recommendation does. It's a catalyst for change. It's a catalyst for improvement. Similarly, IASA produces this document. And uh, the last thing uh, uh, I would like to focus on, as the investigator, it's not your responsibility to implement safety recommendations. It's the responsibility of the change agents uh, in the organization. That is operational departments, the post holding departments, uh, in case of service providers, and civil aviation authorities in case of uh, a state. So as an investigator, you propose uh, the changes and the change agents in uh, in the aviation system, it would be their responsibility to evaluate and implement those recommendations. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's it from my.